slapped yet. I haven't done anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Wadel, and some of you can see me around. I do some work with the senior design classes uh, for the past couple years here. And uh, I I'm, I'm really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to the folks about something that, that's really important to me, and it really should be something important to you as you go forward in your careers as engineers. The time to be thinking about this is now, not further further down the road. So uh, so what I want to ask you to do, I did this last year when, when we met. By the way, last year when I, when I spoke to this group, it was the last Friday before spring break. And it was kind of a thin crowd. I'm glad that there's more people here today, so that's great. But you know, whether you write it down or whether you whether you just remember, just think of two things. As we go through this, think of two things that, that you want to remember, that you want to take away uh, from this from this talk. Okay. So yeah, professional engineering registration, achieving it, retaining it, and, and ultimately using it. That's what I'd like to talk about. Today. I'm a, I'm a professional engineer, bachelor's degree, agricultural engineer from Delaware, uh, master's degree from Michigan State, agricultural engineering. My professional license is agricultural. It is, 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 is as an engineer is in agricultural engineering. So it's kind of uh, agricultural engineering right, right down the core. Uh, so I really look forward to these opportunities of speaking with, with, with students like this because not only do I, I, I like to talk about the specific subject area, but I want to weave into it just some good professional development type things that, that you all just need to know, that the softer things that make you better. you know. The, that the calculus is the hard thing, you know, the derivative of this, the derivative of that is a definite answer. But some of these other things we talk about are softer things that, that you, you just don't learn, you just come by, you learn by experience. And I'd like to focus on that. For starters right here, public speaking 101, 101 I should say. These are, these are the four rules, the four cardinal rules, and I'll try to stick to them, and if I don't, you can remind me if I don't. Adhere to the time of your life, I'm going to do that. Never apologize. In other words, geez, I'm really an awful public speaker, or I'm really nervous, you guys don't care, right? The audience generally doesn't care, the, general, the audience is, is there to hear the talk, so you never apologize to, to the crowd. Know your audience. I've got a real good idea that you guys are students in St. Francis and engineering, ranging from freshmen to seniors. I'm going to structure my talk for you folks. And maybe the most important part is the last one. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. Because you know, at least when you tell them that you told them, if they, if they, if you guys sleep through, you know, 45 minutes of this, the last five minutes when I tell tell you what I told you, maybe you, you'll you'll go away with something. That's okay. So a little bit more about me professionally. I I design manure systems and manure equipment for dairy farms. Okay, this is what we all think of. We like to think of dairy farms as cows in the field, and and that is nice. That's the, the English countryside. And, uh, but the reality of the matter is, this is the way, this is dairy farming today. Um, instead of lots of little farms, there's big farms. Like there used to be lots of little hardware stores, now there's fewer big hardware stores. Agriculture is really the same way. And in, in reality, as, as a design professional, I'll tell you, these farms are, are, are safer for the cows, the ha cows are more healthy, and the environment is better off as compared to cows walking through the you know uh, walking through the fields and down into the stream that's down below there. And so, so ultimately, this is this is what's best for agriculture and it's what's it's what's best for, uh, for for society. So I designed these manure systems and how do you how do you handle manure from these farms? Because what most people don't know is when you go to that dairy counter and you see all those jugs of milk, you know, uh, for every one gallon of milk you see, there's two gallons of manure. That you're not going to have to see, and and but the dairy farmers have to handle that. So that's really what I do: design these systems, and, uh, bio bioenergy systems, treatment systems for uh, for dairy cow. Uh, so so how does that relate to, to environmental engineering? Well, environmental engineering, you guys are in a good 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 place because see this world population, it's going to increase, and in our lifetime, it's in all of our lifetime years, it's probably going to increase by about forty percent. You know. Um, that's 40% more waste. There's 40% more food that's needed. That's 40%, maybe not exactly 40%, but by some percentage more energy that's required. All these things, um, these are solutions. Engineers are going to have to come up with these solutions, and they all revolve around these three things, uh, my view, food, food, fuel, and water. If you're working in environmental, you're in a really good place because in some ways, environmental engineering weaves through, through all of these things. 
Okay, so let's talk about more specific, specifically about professional engineering. Like I said, I'm going to tell you about how, to, why to do it, how to do it, and, and how you use it to keep it. So right now, the why. Right, if if, if everybody gave me your resume, and, and even after four years, you all gave me your resume, and I laid them out on this table. It would be like looking at the start of this race. You really all look the same to me, you know? You really would. And that's not putting anybody down, but it's the reality of the matter of it. The reality of the matter is you haven't done anything yet. You will, but you haven't done anything yet. And so what you need to be looking at is what are those little things, what are those little things that you can do to differentiate yourself from this crowd? What's, what can give you a little bit of a head start on the rest of, of the crowd. And one of the ways to do this is, is by achieving your professional, professional engineering registration. So, so basically what a professional engineering license is, it's, it's the license that, that permits you to do certain engineering activities. And just like other professions, well, who else is, who else is, is registered to do their work? You know? Would you go to, you know, there's different levels of physicians. You know, certain physicians are, have certain certifications, some don't. You want to go to the ones that are board, board, you prefer to go to the ones that are board certified, just as though some people would prefer to hire pe people who, who have professional engineering licenses. So physicians are licensed, accountants are licensed, attorneys, you're on the line. You have to have a, a license to braid hair in Pennsylvania, you know? Can you imagine all the, the tragedies that are averted because people are, are licensed for braiding hair? Dog groomers, nail technicians, boxing promoter, you know? Hey, listen. If all these people are registered, we should be too. Because what it does is, it, 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 well, I'll tell you exactly what it does. It gives you the ability to do certain things that other people can't. Okay? Remember, we want to differentiate ourselves. How do you differentiate yourself? By doing things that other people can't. So here's one example. And it's probably the, the thing that people most commonly think of when it comes to engineering. It's stamping the drawing. You know? And so in this particular case, write a report, do some drawings, do some designs, and, and essentially you're affixing, you're affixing your seal to this, uh, affirm, legally affirming that everything that's put together there was done in accordance to a certain standard, in this case, per the Natural Resources and, and Conservation Services. Somebody with that profession, professional engineering license, they can't do this, okay? So. We want, we want to be licensed because it gives us the ability to do things that other people can't. Well, what, what else is different? Well, you know, in some states, in New York, for instance, you can't own a consulting firm without being a, a licensed professional engineer. What does that mean? So if you, if you were to just uh, want to operate an a, 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 a environmental engineering consulting service out of, your, out of your living room, which a lot of people do quite, quite profitably, you know, you can't do it if you're not a professional engineer. Uh, bid on government public, public projects. That project that, that I showed him, that stamp job, that was a government project. It was a government, it was a, a, a project for which the government was giving a grant, and the, the federal government says, well, if we're going to give money for this project, at least we are going to make sure that the person who did the design is, uh, has a certain level of a certain qualification so to at least hedge our bet that we're putting our money towards uh, something that, that's going to be a success, okay? Believe it or not, in some states, you can't even rep your set, represent yourself as an engineer. You can't even call yourself an engineer unless you have a professional engineer's license. Represent yourself in the, in, in the sense of, of, of uh, um, advertising your services. So. Um, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of uh, the why. Hey, let's face it. What motivates you? Okay, if it motivates me. Uh, maybe it motivates some of you, right? So, so. Okay, professional professional development uh, moment here. Whenever you want to describe a graph for your audience, describe the axes. Okay, describe the lines because oftentimes you forget to put a, a legend on it, or the legend so doggone small nobody can see it. Okay, so on the y-axis we have uh, salary, on the x-axis we have uh, years since receiving a BS degree. 
Red line is with the PE, blue line is with that. Okay. Calculus question. If you integrate under each of those curves, what does it tell you? Area and what and what in this case what does area represent? That would represent the amount of money you earned over your career, or at least over the career career, career of the boundary of five years to thirty-eight years. Okay? So you can see, generally speaking, with a with PE with a PE degree, PEs earn more than, than non-PEs. Why? Because they can do things that non-PEs can't. It's really somewhat, somewhat simple. So if this motivates you, this is just one other thing to put in that category of this might be something to, uh, to consider. Is that clear? So professional engineering license. So we just talked about the why. Now achieving it. How do we go about getting it? Uh, Ada <coughs> Tech accredited degree. If everything goes right for you folks, you're all going to have the ABET. Uh, the ABET accredited degree. Uh, passed the fundamentals of engineering exam, the FE. Who has taken, and, uh, I don't even say passed, who's taken the FE? Uh, okay, good. And I know all three of you passed. <laughs> so, uh, well done, well done, you're on your way. Passed the FE exam, four years of verifiable engineering experience, I'll explain that, and then passed the principles in practice of, of engineering exam, otherwise known as the PE. Uh, so these <coughs> rules vary by state. So uh, as you move on and move out of state, you might you always want to stay up with your most current uh, engineering board for, for how to go about for how to go about uh, being registered. So you know you can think of the FE exam as being it's really your final your final exam. For, for your engineering degree. And the people who have the most success taking the PE, the, the FE exam, do it, taking, the, taking it within, within 12 months of graduation, either while a student or, or within 12 months of graduation. Why? Because it's a final exam for your BS degree in engineering. So they're gonna ask you how to integrate by parts. A year after graduation, you know, it's hard enough to know that as a senior student, let alone a year or two or three after graduation. So you, you want to be taking the FE exam at the time when this information, this fundamental stuff is really fresh in your brain. And I think you folks that took it here this year, it's really kind of a really sweet time to take it. So, uh, so good for you. Good. So uh, test is five hours and 20 minutes long. It's the actual test taking time. That's not the time you're there reading instructions and whatnot. So think about it. Um, maybe some of you had 110 multiple choice, five hours and 20 minutes, 2.9 minutes per question. That's not a lot. Okay? So one of the keys to taking this test and passing this test is having a strategy. And it's like any strategy, or like any plan, don't stray from the strategy. I'm going to give you my strategy for this, and and um, maybe, maybe Jess and, and, and um, the other people who've taken it can uh, uh, affirm this or, or otherwise. And that is, at 2.9 minutes per question, you either know it or you don't. In my view, when you take the FE exam, before you even answer a question, or before you even answer a question in a section, you look at the whole section. Because there is some stuff you just don't know, and even if you get to the reference, you're not going to find an example to help lead you through it. So it really becomes a, a, a matter of either you know it or you don't. Now we get into the P exam; it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. But um, but the, the FE exam, you know, I would go through that in the book, or 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 at least. Um, now it's on computer screen, but you know, you say, let's say it's, it's 10 questions, 20 questions in a section, you say, I know that, and I'm going to come back to it, or I don't know it, and I'm going to put an answer down. You know, 
Because, because if you then, if you can take that time, you can take that time that you, that you didn't spend grinding through something you were never going to know and put it towards something that you knew pretty well and be pretty sure that you got it right. If you're taking the, P, the FE exam and the P exam and you get the answer and the key, does it mean you should check your work? And check your methodology? I'm going to tell you yes. Because every single, every single answer is attainable. So you need to say, yeah, I got that answer. Big, hairy, ugly number. Um, yeah, it could be what's called a distractor. It's there to, to basically lead you into a, a, a trap. But, but, but those traps are designated to be or designed to be by the test writers as um, bona fide errors that people make. And I know this because I'm, I'm involved in the writing of the PE exam, and this is something that, 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 that you do. You, know, you fabricate answers that, um, that are attainable, that, that, that a, will be very reasonable mistakes to make. Okay. So still, go through the test, pick out the ones that you know, put it aside for a moment, pick out the ones that you don't, answer it, move on. Computer-based testing. What, what everybody think about computer-based testing? To me, it seems really foreign. Was it was a good experience. Uh, it was smooth. And, okay. Would you ever, if given a choice, which one would you pick? Okay. And so everybody should also know that the reference is online as well. Right. If you haven't taken the test yet, I would get familiar with that reference. Not only get familiar, what I mean by get familiar with that reference is, you know, by now you're far enough in your engineering career where you might be starting like gather like your little resources and things and book places for conversion factors and stuff like that and constants. You know, you might want to start using that FE manual as your manual. Just so you're familiar with it. You're talking about say, shaving seconds off. Seven, seven different disciplines, including environmental. Be aware that there is a calculator policy. You don't want to show for the test and not uh, and not have a calculator that's uh, that's strictly legal to the MCOES. And, you know, it's really great too because the specification is right there. So you know, NCWS, the, the the testing organization, they want you to pass. They want more engineers. You know, and so they 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 they're as reasonable as they can be to to um, to ensure ensure your success. So know the specification. Know the specification. Know where the questions are going to be. I'm going to tell you something else that's a little bit of a trap that, that not to get lulled into. Everybody buys um, buys the manuals, okay? And there's and there's problems in the manuals. Be aware of the fact that because those pro those specific problems are in the manual, that's not a ref direct reflection that those problems are going to be on the exam. It's really just more a reflection of, of the difficulty of the rigor of the problems that are going to be on the exam. All right? So if you have a, you know, a, 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 a beam, um, well, I wouldn't even go into that. But it, so, so anyway, understand the specification and, and really break down your study accordingly. So let's, let's talk about it the other way. Why do people not get registered? I think a lot of it's the fear, the fear of failure. You know, who wants to, who wants to sit through this and, and fail, and, and, and fail this test? And, no, it's not fun. But, but feel good about this. Seventy-seven percent uh, pass rate. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Remember that the NCWS wants more engineers. They're relying on your 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 university, your institution, to sort out whether or not you know whether or not you belong to be an engineer. But you know. I, I consider that 77% pass rate. That's pretty encouraging. You know, there's other, there's other, yeah, there's different, there's different structural engineering exams where it's down around 30, 40%. That starts getting a little bit, a little bit queasy. You know, so, so feel good about this. This is not something that's ridiculously difficult to obtain. Check this out. You, if, if you think 77% makes you feel good, this is going to make you feel better. So, so this is the fundamentals environmental module, okay? So if you look at it another way, you say, everybody who has a BS degree 
didn't have to take the environmental exam. Okay? If you're environmental, but yet for some reason you find yourself going down the mechanical path, you can take the mechanical path, or the fire, whatever. But the idea is, of people with environmental bachelor's degrees, regardless of discipline they took it in, 96% passed the exam. Okay. That tells me that environmental engineers, when you look at it in the whole total family of FE exams, environmental engineers do really, really well. I mean, 96%? I think it's phenomenal. So feel good about that. So after you get your, uh, so after you get your FE, after you pass it, you know, you're back at that starting line. You all look the same. You work four years. Maybe you sort yourselves out a little bit more. But you need four years of a verifiable, verifiable engineering experience. So actually, like Pennsylvania words, it is four-year progressive. I'm not sure what progressive means in that, in that reference. But experience in a major, I'm not sure what major means. A branch of engineering acquired under the supervision of a professional engineer. So really what they want is they, the, the engineering board wants to wants to look at your your credentials and see that after four years, you are doing things, I'd say, progressively more difficult. You know, you start out um, you start out as maybe a staff engineer after four years, you maybe are are, are a manager. You know, and, and, and you can show over the course of that path that you've taken on more and more and more uh, more and more responsibility. So one of the ways that you you you, uh, you you basically verify that that experience is people. You know you have references, just like I'm sure some of you've gone out now and have gotten uh, gotten references for for jobs and whatnot. It's, it's the same way, but you want to start building your PE your little PE reference network now because you want to be able to show over a period of time some people that can vouch for your engineering experience over a period of time. So, you know, you come across people, you know, thinking, well, you know, we're going to, someday I can circle back to that person and uh, assume they're aware of my work, you know, that's someone who could be a reference for me. Something else that's kind of a myth is someone will say, I'm not registered because I don't work under a professional engineer. That's not completely true. At our company, uh, the first person to get registered in the company, well, he didn't work under a professional engineer. However, however, he was doing PE caliber work, in, that, in this particular case, detailed mechanical design, and he was able to go to PEs that he knew, former professors, etc., etc., and he was able to basically present to them more or less a portfolio, saying, these are the projects that I've designed over the past four years. And so, uh, can you attest to the fact that I have four years of progressive experience in engineering? And this person was successful in, in getting a professional engineering and for getting professional engineering licensure, and, and it's because he wanted it bad, and it was because he was able to, to uh, demonstrate to others or have other people verify the fact that he had been doing, doing work. So, so don't you know, don't take the references thing uh, lightly because for the PE exam you need five references, three PEs, a, a minimum of three PEs, and two and two non-PEs. So, which exam do you take? Because there, as you can see there, that's not even that's not even the whole the whole list. And um, you know, when you when you start thinking about what which exam do you take, you know, Environmental, maybe off the top of your head, might you might think is the answer, but you know we come back to this the canons the canons of engineering ethics, and this is really really serious stuff because engineering is serious stuff. You know we are looking after um, the welfare of of the welfare and safety of the general public. It's a serious business, you know whether it's protecting drinking water, building a bridge, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so as engineers, the one that the one that uh, oftentimes trips people up is performing services only in their area of competence. Performing only your area of competence, and 
And so, you know, you kind of come back and you relate that to, to PE exams. And so, using my example, my previous example, let's just say you graduate with an environmental degree and by, for whatever reason, you end up doing mechanical work, you take a mechanical exam. Or, you know, in some cases, there's not much of a, uh, a distinction between environmental and civil. And so, and so really, that's not, some, not something you have to decide today. It's not something you need to decide. It's, not, it's something you just have to decide four years from now. And it's really just a reflection of what are you doing? What is your day-to-day, -day, what is your day-to-day -day work uh, have you involved with? So in states like Pennsylvania, engineering, engineering licenses are, um, I don't know what the actual word is I call it non-denominational in the sense that you could be a fire protection, a fire protection PE, and you could design uh, manure treatment systems on dairy farms and stamp them. But it comes back to our, our code of ethics of you're performing in areas, you're, you're performing the work in your area of competence. Uh, so there's there's a, there's a PE exam for everybody. PE exam is a little bit different. Eight hours, 80 questions, six minutes per question. It's pencil and paper until October. So it doesn't really apply to you folks because you'll be you're, you're four plus years down the road. But, but uh, so yeah, it'll all be CBT, computer-based testing um, by then. Paper references will also be done by then. So again, like I said with the, with the, with the um, with the uh, with the FE exam, with me, when I'm working homework sets and things like that, now I would have either printed out or bookmarked or whatever these the, the, the environmental engineering um, reference as well as the FE exam reference, just so that it's part of you know you know you know uh, where to go find the density of whatever, you know? You know where that chart is. You, you have it uh, bookmarked or bookmarked in your brain where it is. You know, remember, you're talking about saving minutes here, or seconds here, to help you help get the right answer. My, my recommended strategy for the PE exam varies a little bit. And, and in a PE exam, I, I have a, a middle category. One is, you know it, you're going to come back, and you're going to crush it. The other is, like that FE, I have no idea what this is all about, and I'm just going to put an answer down because no, all the time in the world wouldn't give me the opportunity to figure this out. The middle is, the middle is, I can get this. I can get this. I know there's an example in the book. I know I just have to dust some cobwebs off, but I know I can get that if I just have a little more time. So, if you take one, if you take one item and you answer, if they have no idea, answer it right off the bat. You basically put six minutes in the bank. You take this middle one that maybe could get it, maybe could not. You take six minutes, it turns into twelve minutes. Now you can get it, right? So it's not that's not uh, it's not a foolproof system, but it's just something that that works for me. Do you folks ever uh, have any experience with with uh, just being test taking savvy for, for multiple ch multiple choice questions? Anybody ever have any training in that? Have you? Okay, good. So, like for instance, um, if you if if you look at a, a, a that bunch of answers, and the answers are one, two, three, and seven thousand forty, and you had to guess. For some reason, you're in a position where you had to guess guess an answer. Which one would you guess it would not be? The last one. It's gonna be the last one. Yeah, most often it will it will it will, it will be the last one. It will not be the last one. So if you if you find you're in a position where you have to guess, you take your you, you take your odds from from, from 25 percent to 33 percent. It's just it's just those little things. The other thing is looking for unit traps. You know, there's some of these items will have will, will be set up so that um, you know if it's a construction project, it could be increments of increments of eight or increments of twelve. If you see two two solutions that uh, differ by factors of eight or twelve, you know, pretty good 
pretty good chance that it's one of those answers. And it also tells you you better be careful with your conversion factors. A couple little things there just to, to keep in mind. Here's the pass rates again. Um, so <coughs> here, P, environmental PE, pass rate, 71%. That's really good. You know, here you can see agricultural is uh, Agricultural is 69. So, no, that's a good one. Electrical, electrical and computer, 82. So, um, and then you see there's a pass rate for the second time takers. Really, when you write, when you write PE exams, you don't want there to be second time takers. You want everybody to know it the first time because there is such a thing as you can become, basically, you can, you can, you can get better at taking the test by taking the test more often. It's, it's more of a test of what you know as opposed to how good you are at at uh, taking the test. So, so, um, so again, 71%, that's a really good number. That's a, that should really make you feel good that this is not something that's designed to, uh, to trip you up and, uh, and have you fail. I mentioned some of these things already, and it's kind of the same thing. Be, be aware of the specification. Know what's going to be on the test. It's just like studying for any test, folks. Know what's on the test and study what's on the test. And work problems under time pressure. You know, keep that six minutes in mind. You know, even even try to do them in five minutes, just so that you know you know that you know where to go in the reference, you know how to do the calculation, and you know how to, to just kind of put all the pieces together to come up with the answer. And maybe even maybe even check your work. You know, reviewing theory, reading text, that's not really what gets you get you going. It's 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 answering the questions under time pressure. That's, what, that's the big difference. Have a strategy and stick to it. So once, once all these pieces come together for you and um, you do get, get licensed, you know, it's, it's not over. It's not over because, again, the speeds, the speed license is something really important. And, and it's important that it's used the right way and it's important that you stay um, proficient and you know, especially nowadays, there's there's been some new laws that have come along where you have to continue to to maintain continuing uh, professional development credits. So so we're always going out and getting more and more training. And so Pennsylvania, you have to have 24 continuing education credits over the over every rolling two-year period. And so um, the engineering boards just want to make sure that you're always continuing to hone your craft and get better at what you do. I'll also mention that you know, this is for Pennsylvania. You go to states like Maryland, and in Maryland, you have to have continuing education in certain topics. You need to have something in, um, in ethics and some other things. Uh, not sure what, but but they they, they take the, the continuing continue education and break it into two different categories. And you have to have a certain amount in each, and um, and so yeah, seminars, professional meetings, courses, and it, largely it is a self-regulated it's a self-regulated uh, function in that I've got a I've got a good old paper file when you go to a, a certain seminar and they they print out something that you've been there, you drop it in the folder, and um, you need to be ready to produce that if you're audited. I've been audited. Pays to have have good record of, of those things. So, any questions so far? Okay. So, I just want to kind of come back and again tell you what what I told you, so to speak, in that right off the bat, the reason I could see you becoming Regulatory professional engineer is is to differentiate differentiators. It's really simple. Do what other people can't do. It's really, really simple. Do what other people can't or aren't willing to do. Uh, and and commit to it now. You know, commit if you commit to it now, you'll do it. I know you will. I know you will. Take the FE as soon as possible. This stuff, some of the stuff, um, is really. Um, Fundamental stuff, as the, as the name of the exam implies, some of this fundamental stuff, you um, you, you lose it. You, you definitely you definitely lose it. So take take the exam as soon as possible. 
begin by developing your own PE, PE network. You know, I can be part of your PE network as, as I continue to know you over the years and, and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, and that's, that, that is a really serious part. Think about who you might go to someday with your credentials and say, you know, have a look at what I have here. You know, would you be able to, based on this, verify and attest to the fact and basically put your license at risk by, by vouching for me? Start building that, that network of people. Uh, now, we talk about taking the PE exam. You know, they're so specific. You, know, you can take, you can pretty much take that the exam in really wherever you're, whatever engineering discipline uh, you're, you're working in. So it's not like you have to take something really far flung and and, uh, and uh, be in a real uncomfortable place. And then you know you're 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 always representing yourself as an engineer in the sense that you know or be, having a professional engineering license it's the way you can in a bona fide way represent yourself as a professional engineer in that you can go out and you can say. Um, I'm Jess Mazur, I'm, I'm Jess Mazur, Mazur uh, uh, Environmental Engineering, and um, you, know, you can basically um, have a business of, of doing that, and doing it in, in a way that benefits society, benefits yourself, and, uh, and then ultimately you, know, you want to make sure that you remain in good standing, and do all the, and do all the right things in terms of keeping up with your, with your continuing edu education credits, and uh, practicing in areas where you um, in areas in which you're competent. Uh, the area, you know, when, when, when we get annual, uh, I say, every other month, engineering newsletters. When you see people get um, uh, called in by the engineering boards, it's usually um, for this subject, you know, the, the, the previous subject, and that they're not. Um, they're not. They're representing themselves as an engineer, and they're not PEs, which makes it really difficult then to, to become a PE. Or someone is a um, someone is a uh, someone is say a fire protection engineer. I don't even pick on fire protection, but you know, you're a fire protection engineer, and you're stamping structural drawings, but yet you have no 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 experience in, in structural engineering. So you want to do everything you can to remain in good standing standing and in keep your license and to, uh, to represent our profession. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to you folks and say, back to my, my, two, my two items, my two questions. Is there, are there any two things that uh, maybe anybody want to say? One thing that kind of sticks with you that maybe you want to explore a little bit more or just that you found interesting? Must go second. I know your name's Grace, so I'm going to ask you. And and really, and, and, that, and really, that that holds true with with anything. You know, um, it, it has to do with from a professional engineering standpoint, but it also has to do with. Um, when you get your first job, you want to be the person who comes the earliest, and you want to be the person that stays the latest. It's never too hot, it's never too cold, it never smells too bad. <coughs> Everything else that people hate, you love. I mean that. That's how you differentiate yourself in, in, in general and well, as well in a, as well as in David. I'm just picking people who I know your names. Um, I have that the P exam, you need to have five references with three P you know that before so I thought that was interesting. And really and really I think what you're gonna find when once you are in the working world for three years, I think the example I gave from our company is is um, is an outlier. I think most people have a have will be somewhere with with peas. Um, so so you know but yes that's that that's correct. But there's a really good chance hopefully you'll be at a firm where where you'll 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 
that will be working right side by side with three P's and P's and that will be P's. <coughs> In October of this year, the PD exam is changing from you bring your own references to a board provided electronic manual. This will be this October 2018 will be the last paper and pencil administered exam. Okay, and with the first and with that exam, it will be old school in that you can bring you can bring your references. And so, this is no, no joke, when you go into these PE exams now, people are like you know, the roller boards, like they're going to Disney. You know, people are taking roller board suitcases of books. So, in some ways, this is really good, the computer-based testing, because of those roller boards of books, but, but yes, but yes, so, so everything after October will be, um, will be, will be CBT. Will the the reference be provided in the same way. The same the way. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be just a computer-based test and a computer-based reference. Oh, I guess I mean, will it be available in advance? Yes. Right now, you, yeah. you can all look at the. Yes. And, 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 and it really, I think it makes it easier when when you have that reference. I mean, I don't. Would be old. I would have bothered by having to go through go through computer screens. I'd rather you know lick my fingers and go through paper. But but there's something. Comforting the fact that everything you need to know is there. Like, oh, I didn't bring my reference with the density of brass. You know, uh, uh, it, I know that if it's in the test, I mean, the test. I can tell you, the test writers will write the test using that reference. Um, so, you know, it's got to be there. Something else I'll, I'll mention, and I say this from first-hand experience, having been involved in writing the exam. And I can't emphasize it enough that the NCWS they want you to pass, and they are they are advocates for the for, for the taker. And what I mean by that is after the PE after the PE exam, and, and I'm telling you, the NCWS is engineers and statisticians working hand in hand. So what will happen is the stat statistics they have are are incredible. So, so they, they know that everybody who does well on this particular question, they know, they can predict with scary accuracy how you're going to do on this question. They have so much data. Okay? So, so um, what will happen sometimes is they'll say, hey, everybody did really well on this question. We're predicting that on the question you wrote, you way wrote, we're predicting they they should have done well on that. They didn't. And so what what the NCWS will do is they will they'll um, will send me the question to review it and say this is what this is what most of the respondents chose. Did you write a bad question? And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is yes. In which sometimes they'll take a, a new question and they'll make it a, a they'll, if it's a, if the question's a disaster, they'll make it an all key. Doesn't matter. A, B, C, D. You get scored for right. There's times when you have a dual key where it's like, uh, you know, could have gone either way. Depending on how you interpret this, you're, so they'll say you're distract, you're distracting, your distracting item was so darn good it might have been right. You know. Uh, so I'm mentioning this. Coming back to the idea that um, they are they are and NCWS is an advocate for you to pass. And if the stats don't look right, they are willing to come down and give give the give the, uh, uh, the taker the benefit of the doubt and jump through a lot of hoops as a as a, as a writer to basically verify that you have to the question. Yes. I don't know if you could answer this, but how do they determine what the passing percent rate? Um, what they do is they they look at when, we, when they make an exam. They, as I said, they have very good statistics of of what the pass rates are for for each item. 
and based on the historical, and of course they're not all, they're not, every, every in an exam, every, every item they don't have good stats for because some are new, they're always new coming into the bank. But still, they have enough data, they make sure they include enough old questions or existing questions so that based on that they can make a prediction of what, the, of, of what, of what a pass rate would be. And it is somewhat, it is somewhat uh, 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 subjective in that the NCWS will, 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 will craft, uh, will, will come up with a recommendation, and then as the writers, sometimes we'll sit down and say, we think that's, that's uh, reasonable or, or not reasonable. The, the other thing about the PE exam is you have to understand this the concept that they're testing. The, con the concept is called minimal competency. And, and minimal competency means, think, well, think about the converse. The converse would be maximal competency, where really, if you're testing someone's maximum competency, you're really finding, when do they break? What's, I mean, so, so how do you test, think about it, it's like, how do you test what somebody doesn't know? You know why do you, so so, so it's, it's safer and more measurable to taste to test a minimum quantity, uh, minimum capability, and say a, mi a minimally complicated. You know what I mean? Uh, they should know. They should know this. And on that same token, you know, it's because some people have PEs and some people don't. Don't make it. Don't don't anybody think that it makes you any more high and mighty, because it just means that you're you've been tested to be minimally competent. Okay. <laughs> Right? So it doesn't make you any better. It just means that you've taken the test that says that you're minimally competent. So if someone isn't a P, it just means they haven't taken the test. They could be maximally competent. Uh, so anyway, that's what's that's that's what's well. And I think that's the reason why you see pass rates in the 60s and 70s, you know, 80s, 80 percent, because they're testing the Any other uh, questions, points, ahas? Can you know if the license is more than one PE? I mean, more than one field? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. Uh, and here, and I'll give you an example. Uh, California, so I mentioned, I mentioned in Pennsylvania, and I don't know what the technical term is. In Pennsylvania, you can be an agricultural engineer and you can stand fire protection drawings. California is very, very specific. You know, if you're an agricultural engineer, you need to work in agriculture. If you're a civil engineer in water resources, you need to do civil and water resources. So, so in states like California, and I think New Jersey, and I think Alaska, they recognize these disciplines specifically. So my, my engineering license is professional engineer. These other states is professional engineer in so, Good, good question. But again, this is not gospel in the sense that when, when, when your time comes to register, go to your local engineering board. I keep on mentioning the NCAAF, national, NCAAF.org, National Council for Engineering Examination and Surveying. They're kind of like the clearinghouse for all this. And they, it's a fantastic site to help you hone in on where to go for, for your particular state board's uh, engineering, engineering uh, requirements. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.